Thank you for joining us for another episode of Beyond the Surface. Today I'm really excited to go beyond the surface with Steve Buckhance. Uh, Steve is the Wizards play-by-play -play guy. He's been doing it for 20 years. He's also a four-time Emmy Award winner. Uh, and Steve has just a very interesting journey. Uh, and I'm excited to get his perspective as a performer because he's probably the biggest performer that we'll interview. The athletes, the coaches, the executives. Uh, Steve's gonna give us insight into what it's like to be on camera almost every day and uh, give great perspective. So I'm excited for us to go beyond the surface with Steve Buckhead. So Steve, I'm excited to have you, not just because I've been listening to you since I was like, I'll show my age here, about <laughs> about 10 or 12 years old. That sort of shows my age too. Yeah, a little, I think, did you start with home team sports or is home team sports already gone? Well, I started with Channel 5 okay. and that even in it of itself was not a start. That was my fifth TV station that I worked for. Okay. Uh, I got into this business in college in 1974 in radio at a place called Madison College which became James Madison University. Oh. <clears throat> and I started in radio in 74 when I got there. I got into television there in 1977 as an intern at the local ABC station in Harrisonburg, Virginia. But you knew you wanted to do sports? I knew I wanted to do communications okay. and I knew I, I wanted to do sports. Okay. And at that time, the only avenue was radio. You didn't come, you didn't go into college thinking you were gonna be on, on television. And you certainly didn't go into college thinking you were going to get a job on television. If you wanted to get into journalism or sports or communications, you started in radio. It's interesting because I don't know if you know this about me, but uh, when I was growing up, I used to play video games. And my friends hated me because I would do the play-by-play -play for every video game. Right. He shoots his scores! Right. And so as a kid, it's like, what do you want to do when you're a grown-up? And I thought I wanted to be you. And Steve's my cousin, so uh, you know when I was a teenager and he was doing the wizard stuff and growing up in this area, and I'm sure you hear this, people have fallen in love with your passion and your energy and what you bring. And I would do that when I'd play video games. And I ended up going to Syracuse. And one of the things that attracted me to Syracuse was the Newhouse School. Sure. Uh, and I would see Mike Tirico and Bob Costas, all these yeah. guys who were Syracuse guys. I didn't end up going that route, um, which is good for I think the rest of the world. But uh, it's interesting because by then, I'd already been thinking about TV. Yeah. And probably didn't even think about radio. Well, that's the difference in uh, today's era, yeah. today's age. Uh, back then, you didn't think about television. You just wanted to get into the business somehow. And back then, the way to do that was in radio. And if you were in college, it was the campus radio station. So when I transferred from the University of Miami to Madison College, uh, we had our first meeting of the campus radio station. Our campus radio station, which was called WMRA, had 10 watts of power. Mm -hmm. You could basically yell farther than the signal. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. And at the first meeting, there were eight people. And I was the only one interested in sports, mm -hmm. which was great because <clears throat> not only did they send me out to do a baseball game, a, a Madison College baseball game on the campus radio station, but the next semester they made me the sports director. Mm -hmm. So there I was at, um, I don't know, 19 years old, and I was the sports director of the campus radio station, which had no power, but was a radio station. Right. But I also spun records, albums, and did a night shift and all of that stuff. Uh, but I would, I would come up to the Capitol Center to cover Bullets games, uh -huh. and I'd bring my little tape recorder up there and do interviews with players and that kind of thing. You, you sort of, you're at the Cap Center, uh, how do you end up at, at Fox 5 and, and what's that journey? Well, like? there's a lot in between <laughs> Fox 5 and, right? yeah. Um, I, I interned at the, the local TV station in Harrisonburg that had me on the air. I started sending out uh, videotape resumes. Again, back then there were no DVDs. Yeah. There was no internet. So if you were looking for a job in communications, radio, TV, there was only one place to do it, and it was called Broadcasting Magazine, printed right here on DeSales Street in Washington, D.C., right across from the Mayflower Hotel. That was the only place you found out about jobs. Mm -hmm. You looked in the back of that magazine, and in the classifieds, it said, opening for news guy or weather or sports. Well, that's how I got my second job. I applied out of broadcasting to a station. Didn't say where it was. It said the Sun Belt. 
I'm thinking beautiful Florida, yes. whatever, wound up being Chattanooga, Tennessee. And at this time, is the dream job in your head to be one of those weekday guys on a news channel? What's the dream job at that point? Well, there's, there was no dream job. I set little goals for myself along the way. I never said, I mean, ultimately, I'm sure I would have, uh, in the back of my head, I was saying, hey, I'd love to get back to Washington and be in my hometown. But when you're 20 years old and you're working in the 196th market in the country, right. Harrisonburg, Virginia, you're not thinking about being Glenn Brenner at Channel 9, who was there at the time, in a big, major market. You're just trying to move up through the ranks, Do your climb job the ladder. Really well. you, 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 move, you hope to get to the next TV station, and then from there you hope to get to the next one, and from there you hope to get to the next one, and if that leads you to a place like Washington, perfect. Right. That's how that worked, and that's what I did. Uh, Chattanooga was the 71st market in the country. I was there a year and five months. I applied for a job in Nashville, Tennessee, which was the 30th market in the country at the time. Much bigger market, state capital, much better television station than the one in Chattanooga. Did weekend sports there in Nashville. I was only there 10 months. Applied for a job in Atlanta, Georgia. Got a job doing the weekend sports at the biggest and best TV station in the South, WSB TV. And uh, they were number one in Atlanta forever. And uh, got a job there doing weekend sports and um, was there for three and a half years. Then started looking to move up, and at that point from Atlanta, I could make the jump to Washington, which I did. I got a job at WTTG Channel 5, which at the time was owned by a man named John Kluge, who has since passed away, but was in Charlottesville, one of the richest men in the country. Uh, owned our TV station, WTTG, and five others, one in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, big time TV stations. He ended up selling those six TV stations to Rupert Murdoch, and they became the Fox Television Network. That what you see on Fox today started with six TV stations, including Channel 5 in Washington. Wow. That was my next job. I did weekends there to start, and then they made me the weekday guy. And, and then when I was doing TV there, the, anchoring the sports, I started uh, doing play-by-play in different areas. I did Georgetown games, which are aired on Channel 5. So talk about the transition from doing uh, those three-minute, seven-minute clips right. to having two and a half, three hours, yeah. three and a half hours. Whatever. Yeah, it's an interesting transition um, because uh, I knew I loved doing play-by-play -play and I had done that even in Atlanta and even as far back as Nashville. Uh, I did a game once with Sam Jones, was my, uh, my color guy. And, uh, Just because he uses sports? He, he had a tie to one of the uh, coaches at Tennessee State University uh, uh, in, uh, Na in Nashville. And uh, we ended up doing the game together, which was very cool for me. But um, <clears throat> for me, uh, I was doing a lot of freelance play-by-play -play at Channel 5. Uh, not only um, Georgetown games, as I said, but Big East games. And then I did the Navy football on the radio for seven years, from 91 to 97. And when Fox came to, when Fox got football, and that was the whole Rupert Murdoch thing after he bought the six stations from John Kluge, uh, Fox got football in, uh, you know, the late, uh, well, Metro Media became Fox in the late 80s, and Fox became uh, carrying football in 1994. And I was fortunate enough to go out to Los Angeles to do an audition for play-by-play -play for the NFL on Fox and ended up doing three games that were on Fox. Mm -hmm. So um, th that was big for me. Uh, so I knew that the play-by-play -play was something I really loved to do. The, the transition is, is, uh, was, was interesting because I knew I wanted to do games. The Bullets had a, the, one of the great play-by-play -play guys I think ever, a guy named Mel Proctor, and uh, he left <clears throat> in 1996 to do San Diego Padres baseball with about 20 games to go in the bullet season. Mm -hmm. So Susan O'Malley, <clears throat> the president of the Bullets who I had a relationship with, um, asked me if I would do some of the games, myself and Dave Johnson. So we pretty much finished out that season after Mel had left. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew that I wanted to do those games the next year knowing that they were going to be hiring somebody to do Bullets basketball. I also did, was not under contract at the time to Channel 5 while I was still working there, which was a good thing for me. And I went to Susan and I said, look, I really want to do these games next year. 
and I'm prepared to leave Channel 5 if I have to. Because she said to me, well, when the game, when we get going in uh, October and November, November, which is one of the biggest ratings periods of the year, when TV stations want all of their anchors to be at the station, and meantime, your, your people are going to see you out doing Bullets games. That's, we need you to do the games. Sure. Same thing in May, second biggest May sweeps. Um, I said, again, uh, I'm prepared to leave the station if I have to. And I did. So I got- Is that a big risk at the time? Because like, we look at it now and we see the local TV stuff is broadcasting pretty much every game. And you know, some networks even, some teams even have their own network. Um, but HTS wasn't in a lot of homes per se. I remember in our family, my dad probably doesn't want to say this, but we had it only in his bedroom because he had a black box and me and my brothers would you know go into his bedroom to watch a bullets or a caps game right. um so like how many games were they broadcast back then and was that a big risk or was that something that you felt pretty comfortable about at the big time? risk leaving channel five yeah. it wasn't for me i had anchored for 20 years okay. in in five different cities so i had had, had my fill of anchoring Got it. here's the key to this brian <clears throat> and the reason why i did what i did if you asked 100 sportscasters what they really like to do, 99 of them will tell you play by play. Right. It's the most fun you can have in our business. The anchoring is great, and I did it for 20 years at five different stations, 14 in Washington, major market. And it's a, it's a good opportunity for exposure, especially back then because we didn't have all these other channels. You had channel four, five, seven, and nine in this market, and. That was it. Yeah. And when you covered the Redskins, people went to you to see there was no Comcast Sportsnet. Uh, home Team Sports didn't cover the, the Redskins like the local stations did. Sure. And people didn't know where it was to go get it. So that was a big deal at the time. But I did that for 20 years, and I knew I loved play-by-play. -play. And you don't get the opportunity to get an NBA job very often. There are only 30 of them in the country. Yeah. And um, so when you get one, or you get the opportunity, you go after it. And I had had my fill of anchoring 20 years, and I was ready to, to make the next step. So for me, it was not a risk. It was an easy decision. People ask me to this day, do you miss Channel 5? Do you miss anchoring? And the answer is no. The only thing I miss sometimes is the camaraderie, uh, covering big events like Super Bowls. You know, I do miss being at Redskin Park and being involved in the team and that kind of thing. But um, my job now is, uh, I've said this publicly to many people, I think I have the best sports job in Washington. So here's what I want to do next. I want to go deep into that job. Uh, you know, you are a performer. And what I do is I work with performers. And I have a saying, performing is performing. So whether you are LeBron James and you're in the NBA Finals, or you are Bruce Springsteen and you've got to go on stage for a big show, or if you're Steve Buckhans and uh, you've got a... Uh, a playoff game uh, or a regular season game or any type of game, right. uh, you're a performer. So what I like to do is ask questions that all performers have to deal with in some capacity. So I want you to think about these questions from your perspective. Okay. You can blend it with probably some of your philosophical beliefs when it comes to basketball uh, because watching basketball for 20 years in the seat that you've sat in, sat in and flown on the plane with these guys and interacted with probably some of the best minds in, in basketball. I'm sure there's an, another perspective. So feel free to inter, inject that okay. into some of your thoughts. Yep. But I'm gonna ask you what I call our preferences. So what they are, I'm gonna ask you, it's either this or that. And I want you to pick one as it, as it relates to you. And it's not necessarily right or wrong, but it's sort of your belief system and, and how you look at the world. Okay. So the first one I'm gonna ask you is preparing or <clears throat> performing. Which do you prefer, the preparation or the performance? I prefer the performance, there's no question. That's an easy one for you. That's an easy one. The preparation is tedious, it's difficult, but it's necessary in any facet of life. But if you're involved in public speaking or performing, as you say, whatever, uh, you've got to be prepared. And if you listen to all great announcers, preparation is paramount. And this is where I, where I want to pick your brain a little bit, which is, you're around basketball players, you see the work that gets put in. A lot of times people don't understand the preparation that really goes in to a game. Right. They see the two and a half hours in a basketball game and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, do you think players tend to be 
prefer preparation or do you think they tend to prefer performances? Performances. I mean, they like playing in the game. I don't know too many guys that enjoy practice. Yeah. I really don't. Um, and we've all been on teams and had to practice and did two a days in high school and nobody liked that. Are you more of a yes sir guy, sir guy or a why guy? Do you prefer when you're in positions where you just have to say yes sir or do you like to know why you have to do something? I seem to always question everything that's, every directive that's given to me or whatever. I generally say yes sir. But I, I, yeah, there's, there's thought behind everything, whether it's coming from my peers, my colleagues, uh, my boss, a police officer. Uh, I'm, I'm always questioning everything. Uh, I do like to know why. And with that in mind, the next question is, do you prefer a system or autonomy when it comes to your job? And then we'll get into basketball as well. Well, uh, systems are um, relevant and important, but I tend to think after over 40 years in this business, I have my own system, I have my own formula. Uh, I, do, I do sometimes look to others to find direction. Uh, there's no question that when I was young and impressionable, I, there were guys that I modeled myself after. What you're talking about there is so interesting. I, I saw Aaron Rodgers interviewed last night and he talked about you know, watching Tom Brady like literally every play of Tom Brady during a year. Yeah. Uh, and that's a peer to his. Sure. Uh, but when he was starting out and he's younger than Brady, you know, he's like, yeah, I'd watch every play that he would make because I wanted to try to steal things. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that athletes today, it's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not trying to be like Michael Jordan or right. I'm not trying to be like Kobe Bryant. It's like, okay, I get that. <clears throat> but you can still watch them and steal things. And, you can. And take I, I, th I don't think there's any question that people emulate other people. However, I also believe that you develop your own style. I mean, you can't help but develop your own style. Unless you are just a copycat and you just mimic yourself completely after another person, and there are people that do that. Uh, but I, I just, you know, I think you develop your own style, you develop your own mannerisms, the way you call a game. Um, it, it just, it becomes your personality. Perfection or progression? Perfection. I mean, I'm a perfectionist, which is very frustrating because I'm not perfect. Um, I don't know anybody that is, but I make mistakes, and I'm really mad at myself when I make mistakes. And a lot of that comes from preparation. The more prepared you are, I think, the fewer mistakes you make. But you still make mistakes, and some of them are out of your control. I get really mad at myself when I make a mistake because I made it. I get infuriated when I make a mistake because someone else caused me to make a mistake. Do you prefer the most valuable player? And you can think of this from a basketball standpoint. Most valuable player or most improved player? Um, do I prefer? Yeah, like who do you, which, which resonates more with you? Probably most valuable. Okay. Okay. Um, well, because guys should improve each year. That doesn't mean they should improve so drastically that they go from six points a game to 26 points a game. Those guys are special. But people who are viewed as the most valuable player on their team, and I, and I hate the fact that there's an MVP of the league. Um, there should be an MVP for each team. There's just too many good players who are the most valuable. <clears throat> and even in this last NBA Finals, I disagreed with the choice of LeBron James. Yeah, he was spectacular and his numbers were unbelievable, but I thought Kyrie Irving was the most valuable player on Cleveland. And without him, they clearly would have not won the, won the championship. I thought the shots he made were, were just, uh, he was unstoppable. The timing of that question is interesting because this past year was the first year that I can remember where the most valuable player and the most improved player could have been the same person. And Stephen Curry actually even got votes as the most improved player. Uh, so it's an interesting dynamic because I think in some ways our society loves the improved. We cheer for the underdog, the guy that gets better. Uh, I think it's part <coughs> of what makes Steph Curry so marketable. Yeah. Um, yet there is something to be said for the guy who the light is on and they still say, okay, I'm okay with that light, that spotlight on yeah. me. And for your job, there's literally a spotlight on you and you have to almost be okay with that spotlight and say, yeah, give me the mic. I want the mic in my hand yep. for that last call. Yep. So it's interesting to get your perspective on that. Which, which do you prefer more, the resume or the eulogy? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question because as you get older, you start thinking about your own eulogy. I know it's a bit morbid, but um, um, 
<clears throat> you start thinking about those kinds of things, which maybe eulogy is not a good word, maybe legacy is a better word. Um, but, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, my resume is pretty full at this point. I've done a lot, I've been in the business for over 40 years, have interviewed just about everybody that there is to have been interviewed, um, <clears throat> have done some things, you know, we can all uh, um, strive to achieve higher goals, and I certainly have them even now, but I have achieved a lot of things that in my head, if I don't get any higher, I did them and I'm happy with them. I've done network football games, I've done professional basketball games, I've called Army-Navy games, I've done um, you know, local broadcasting, uh, helped in a charity ways in a lot of different venues. Now you would answer that eulogy? Um, no, no, not necessarily. I think resume is still, still big, but eulogy or legacy, as I would prefer to call it, um, is really what people have to say about you when this is all over. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting is eulogy is sort of your character, right? Like, who were you as a person? And that's not to say that what you did along the way won't be part of the eulogy, mm -hmm. but people will really remember how you treated other people, sure. your character. And I think a lot of times people that are in their 20s are so focused on resume because they have to yeah. that sometimes they lose some of the eulogy. Yeah. I mean, my resume is what it is, and it's in it's in the back sh on the back shelf now because I don't really need it anymore. Yeah. Uh, but uh, your eulogy or your legacy, what you've left, what you've done, how people remember you—that's the most important thing. I want you to answer this one in terms of your job and how you look at your job: evaluations or descriptions. Um, probably descriptions. You have to be more careful with evaluations. I mean, I'm, I'm not there to evaluate the talent. I'm there to describe how it is. Uh, you can get into certain parts of evaluation, but uh, for me, it's just being more descriptive. Positive feedback or negative feedback? Positive. I hate negative feedback. I hate to be criticized, and yet I know I am because I'm in the public eye and, and a lot of people that probably don't like what I do or my style. Uh, I, I try to not uh, see those comments if I can help it, but they're all out there in today's world. So I enjoy positive feedback. I want you to think about this from a basketball team perspective, so less from your, your role. Uh, culture or talent? Um, I, for me, and, and the way I am now, and I'm an old school guy and I'm getting older, uh, it's more about culture. Everybody can play the game on the level of professional basketball. They're all good players. I tend to evaluate guys now on what type of person they are. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind that most of them are 22, 23 year old kids that don't have a lot of experience in life. But the ones that tend to get more out of life than just bouncing a basketball and scoring are the ones that I gravitate to. And there are some of those guys. It's probably, I've been fortunate to go to the NBA Combine and interview these guys uh, when they're going through the draft process. And I've always loved the NBA draft. I actually had an NBA draft website for a little bit. And it was so interesting to me to get to know the human side of these guys. And it was fascinating to see how that impacted their career uh, and has impacted their career because it's things you just can't see if you're watching TV. Um, it's hard, it's really hard to see those things. But when you sit down with someone and get to know who they are, their background, their, how they see the world, which is why I love doing this, because it's beyond the surface. It's sure. beyond what you just see and understanding what really makes people who they are. Um, do you prefer to be pumped up or calmed down before you go on air? Uh, calm. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you can't be excited and feel the adrenaline flowing. You have to. Uh, and you have to show energy. <clears throat> every producer I've ever worked with will say, more energy, more energy. Mm -hmm. So you need to be energetic. Uh, but I like to be in a calm situation. I'd go all the way back to high school. I was a kicker in high school. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the worst thing that I could do was to run out onto the field with the, you know, the referee counting the clock on, you know, in between plays and have to run back there and set up and kick. <clears throat> I would prefer and this never happened back then, but it happens now all the time. I would prefer the other team to call a timeout to try to ice me 
because I could gather my thoughts. And see, this is something that you never hear about today. And in the playoffs, they just started using going to kickers to talk to them on the field, which I thought was brilliant because it brings a whole new line of thinking that people never addressed. <clears throat> As a kicker, I would love to go out onto the field and be able to stake my claim like a dog and get out there and feel the turf and see and set up and think about what I'm going to do. The worst thing I could do as a kicker would be to have to rush right. to kick. So I think that just the opposite happens when a kicker goes out and they ice him. I would rather have the time to relax and get my thoughts together and get calm instead of being all hyped up. I'm smiling because now you're talking my language, which is they've done research on this stuff. So they found that icing the kicker doesn't work. Uh, and I think they actually perform better. And I saw uh, Robbie Gould, the Bears kicker, interviewed. And he said, yeah, I can just get back into my routine. It's, for me, it's all about can I nail my routine? Can I, I'm so routine oriented. So to your point, if that routine is rushed, I'm going to be in trouble. But if I can give me a few more seconds, I'm going to be in my routine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be good. They also looked at it in the NBA for free throw shooting. And they found, they found the same thing. I think when they ice a guy before he shoots a free throw, uh, he shoots 76% from the line. Um, and if they don't ice him, it's like the same percentage. And the same thing happens with kicking. It's, fa it's a fascinating it study. Is. Would you prefer to be liked or respected? <clears throat> well, I would say respected because I think if you're respected, while necess that doesn't necessarily mean everybody's going to like you, I think the majority of people that respect you like you. Love winning or hate losing? <clears throat> um, that's a really good question. I love winning, and I hate losing. Give me one. Um, uh, probably hate losing. Risk taker or rule follower? Rule, rule follower. follower. Uh, balance or specific obsession? Specific obsession. Why? Because I'm obsessive, because I, I, I know what I like. And the older you get, you'll find out that the more, this is a cliche, but the more set in your ways you become. doesn't mean you can't change or adapt. You have to. But you definitely are more set in your ways and you know what you like. Fear of failure or fearless? Fear of failure. Why? <clears throat> because I know what it's like to have failed on the air. And when you're on TV, especially when the camera's on you and you fail, that's about as exposed as you can be. And uh, there's nothing worse than that feeling. And it's happened to me many times. And uh, I, sometimes I would go into a sports cast at night hoping to just make it through without making a mistake as opposed to saying, I'm so confident I'm just going to nail this whole thing. You just would get through it and say, just don't let me screw up. I love this one because the more successful performers I meet, the more fear of failure plays a major role. There's quotes from Kobe, there's quotes from Michael Strahan, uh, Serena Williams, Usain Bolt. They all talk about the fear of failure being a huge part of their success. Yet, if we go to any college campus in May for a commencement speech, the message that often gets delivered is don't be afraid to fail. And I understand why they're saying that message. They're saying go for it, you know, try things. But the message that's sometimes getting lost is no, you also have to have a healthy fear of failure and understand that no, I'm not failing. It's not going to happen. Not on my watch. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I don't fail. Well, and that's, you know, I think that's the biggest thing that needs to be imparted to young people today, which I don't think a lot of commencement speakers do. Yeah. And that is, and I say this to people all the time, <clears throat> and I, I quote the Rolling Stones song, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you get what you need. Yeah. You can aspire, you know, when, when somebody for people only in my, I can't speak to any other business, but in my business, when I used to hear people say, you, you can do anything you want to do. What a crock that is. <laughs> you can't do anything. I wanted to be an astronaut. Well, I wasn't good enough in math to be an astronaut, and I didn't go into the military. I did the next best thing for me. I got my pilot's license. Right. You, you know, I would love to be Jim Nance, yeah. who has the greatest job in the world, but it ain't going to happen. So do the next best thing that you can where you can derive satisfaction from that. For me, you know, I have one of 30 jobs in the country doing NBA play-by-play, -play, and it's a great job, and I've had a great career. <clears throat> so I think you have to be careful when you say to someone, you can do anything you want to do. That, that's not true because there are other people that may control your destiny, not just you. In my business especially, if somebody comes in and they don't like the way I look, 
I may be out of a job just because of the way I look, sure. or I'm not the right uh, skin color, or I'm not the right, my face doesn't look, or I'm not the right gender right. for what they're looking for. That's my business, and that's one of the harsh realities of my business. I think one of the things you've hit on during our time together is find out what you're good at, work your ass off at that, keep focusing on the, you said small goals. Right. Right? Keep focusing on what you can do right here. I use the phrase, be where your feet are. Set your goals high and try to achieve them. Right. But if you can't get there, then get the next best thing, and don't stop trying to achieve that high goal. Always go after it. The late Glenn Brenner gave me some of the best advice I ever heard growing up. In fact, I was just moving from Harrisonburg to Chattanooga. And he said, if you throw enough shit against the wall, some of it's going to stick. In other words, it's like golf. If you don't get it to the hole, it's got no chance of going in. You've got to at least get it there. So keep trying. Keep trying. You'll get knocked back a few times. Get up and keep trying. You may not get what you want. I may not be the anchor of NBC Nightly News, which I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be at this stage of my career. I may not be Bob Costas or Jim Nance, but I'm going to get what I, what's going to make me happy. And you have to be satisfied with that. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for coming in. I know I put you on the hot seat here. Uh, I'm not surprised, but you did a great job. It was fun for me to see you on this side of things. Uh, hopefully it was a little bit fun for you. And uh, for me, it's fascinating to hear your perspective on performing and your ma mindset, your mentality, how you see the world. Uh, and I think, honestly, a lot of athletes, uh, coaches, other people can benefit from hearing that perspective and how you look at it because we're all performers in one way, shape, or form in our life. And if we can learn from people that consider themselves to be performers, which are, by the way, all of us, uh, hopefully there's something to be gained. So thanks for coming in, sharing your time. Uh, cousin Steve, uh, and thanks for going beyond the surface. Thanks, Brian. Enjoyed it.